comic book fans, and welcome to another exciting edition of Cammy's Comic Corner. I'm your host, as always, Cammy. Now, we have a lot of, to cover this episode, so please, uh, be sure to watch it all the way through for a cool little contest at the end of the show. It's gonna blow your fucking mind, people. So, let's get right to the pick of the week. First up from Dynamite Entertainment, we have Battlefields, Dear Billy, number three, written by Garth Ennis and art by Peter Schnirzenberg. So we find Carrie and Billy with their uh, American chums talking about the war and different experiences, and Billy's telling a rather tragic tale about how he lost his best chum in one of the wars. There was a lot of bloodshed because they were in their planes shooting, like, shooting fish in a barrel, pretty much. And unfortunately, his friend has some problems with this airplane, and Billy's forced to watch him die right in front of him from Japanese execution. And the other guys are going, oh, whoa, whoa this might be a little too, uh, too graphic for Carrie. Uh, well, maybe we should, you know, ch uh, choose a different subject. But Carrie doesn't mind because she's really on the inside. She hates all Japanese, especially, and can you blame her after what they've done to her? They've raped her. They've shot at her, left her for dead. It's just, you know, to go through that much trauma, no wonder she's still smothering Japanese prisoners that come into the hospital. And uh, she even does it to one who seems to be cooperative with the American forces, but he has a little bit of a mouth on him. You know, treats women without any respect, as it were. So, the doctors have finally uh, noticed that she seems to be on all these shifts that result in the prisoners uh, dying under, under guard. So, she was the only one in the room, so she decides to maybe take her leave. Uh, she follows Billy, and they, they're living together now. Obviously, they're going steady, but then they get news that the atomic bomb has been dropped on Japan, and now no one knows what the future holds in, the, in this whole debacle. But after a victory dinner, she finds out that the Japanese are probably going to be their allies now. And uh, Billy tells her that now we have to learn to love them. And that just makes her furious, because after all she's been through with the Japanese, the last thing she wants to do is, you know, love them. She wants all of them dead. And so she decides she doesn't want to live in a world anymore. And at the beginning of this series, we thought that she might be writing a letter to the, a dead Billy as a little, you know, goodbye, last farewell. But no, it's her own last farewell as she takes her life in the bathtub because she wants to be rid of all Japanese. So it is a very, very emotional book. It's a very, it tugs at your heartstrings. And ever since issue one, I mean, it's a three-issue miniseries, but when this comes out in trade, be sure to pick it up. Garth Ennis sure knows how to write any character, male or female. And in the last two arcs, we've gotten mainly female characters. But Dear Billy, it's just been a marvelous series from Dynamite and under the Battlefield storyline. Now on to the Fast Five. First up from Marvel, we have Guardians of the Galaxy number 12. Now, in the last issue, we found Maelstrom holding uh, Phyla, a.k.a. Quasar, and Drax above the Dragon of the Moon, and he was going to feed them to her, her being the dragon, and get his sweet escape. Well, it turns out that Phyla, a.k.a. Quasar, has been swallowed whole, and Drax just assumes the worst. The dragon all of a sudden rises, so now they're against a dragon, but fear not, it's Phyla who comes out of the dragon, sword first, with Heather. Heather in her arms, her long-lost love, Heather, Drax's uh, daughter. It's just, a, it's a great moment, and she's been reborn into something different. So now, that has been a fun little story in the Oblivion world, and Oblivion obviously has something coming at the end. Now it's on to the War of King crossovers. Very cool, very cool issue. I really enjoyed this. Next up from Marvel, we have Thunderbolts number 130. Now, this is a part of the Magnum Opus storyline. It's the Deadpool crossover. One of the main reasons why I picked this, because I wanted to see how Andy Diggle would write Deadpool. And sure enough, he's got all the same Deadpool humor. Last issue, Deadpool was in the Avengers Tower. Uh, he ran into the Thunderbolts and figured out that Norman Osborn isn't in that same building. He's across the street. But apparently, after fighting with the Thunderbolts, he makes his, his, his heroic getaway. And it turns out it's all according to... Norman Osborn's plan. Teleports away, they come find him because he has a tracking device on him, but this time he's on the offensive and he is the one who set the trap for them to fall into, including having some bug spray on Ant-Man. That, that was pretty funny. 
And sure, he has all of the Thunderbolts beaten. As he's about to take out their team leader, Black Widow, he gets all gushy and mushy, and he has feelings for her. And you know, that's Deadpool. That's classic Deadpool. Always falling for the hotties. But can you blame him? Tune in at next issue of Deadpool to find out what happens. Next up from Dark Horse, we have The Umbrella Academy, Dallas, number 5. Now, this issue takes place in 1963, throughout the entire issue. Sure, you have number 5 trying to stop himself, his future self, from not assassinating the president with the temps people. And then you have over in Vietnam, a day before Dallas, Kraken, as a, uh, as a soldier, a Vietnam soldier, leading his battalion... Well, they're, they have a, a lost ancient mummy that's apparently supposed to end the war, but the mummy kind of gets out of control. They fight vampire Viet Cong, or Viet Cong vampires, and it's just, it's a crazy issue. But now, they have a televator working properly, and now they're going to go and teleport to Dallas. And it's, it's all going to happen in the final issue, people. This has been a great series. Gerard Way and Gabriel Ba, they just make me swoon every issue. Next up from Marvel, we have Nova number 23. So Richard Ryder is dying. He has nothing else to do for the next couple of days. But it turns out that the Pegasus headquarters, it's being taken over by Hammer. So everyone has to evacuate the building. Him and the uh, scientist Dr. Uh, Necker, sh they leave. Uh, she really wants to help him because she doesn't want to see him die. So she takes him to her underground operation that she kind of uses sometimes when she's a part of this little organization known as uh, AIM. You know, it's just AIM. They're cool guys, right? They're not a terrorist organization, which Richard Ryder has a really hard time with. But in the meantime, while all this is happening, the Nova Corps has been called away to go fight in the War of Kings event. So they're all off. They, they all hop on the ego and then it's choo-choo, light speed across the galaxy. And in, the, and in the end of this issue, we find out that she has some quantum flask, and as Richard Ryder breaks it, we see Wendell Vaughn, who was just called away in Guardians of the Galaxy issue number 12. He comes back and says, here, have some quantum bands. I don't know if that's how it really sounds like, but I thought it was appropriate at the time. And so Richard Ryder puts on the quantum band, and now he is Quasar. So it's like, what? So now it's going to be Quasar versus Nova, just to get his old Nova uniform back, or just to go after... Worldline. Anyway, it's going to be a kick-ass War of Kings crossover next issue. I can just feel it in my bones. After all, we have a new Quasar now. And finally this week from Marvel, we have X-Force Cable Messiah War One-Shot. Now, X-Force, this is mainly, uh, kind, half of it is getting the reader, any new readers, caught up. The other half is finding out that X-Force is in the future of 2973, because that's where Hope and Cable are located, according to Beast. Uh, they find out that they're not alone. They have, they run into a Merc with the Mouth. That's right, he's still alive after all this, all these years. And he is the Emperor of North America. So finally they meet up with Cable and Hope. Cable really wants them not to be there because apparently they've all fallen into a trap. Not a trap set by Bishop, but by someone who Bishop has hired. It is none other than Strife, Cable's clone. And he's, he's not a nice man. He's done some really bad things in the past. So it's a very cool little prologue, and I can't wait to see this whole Messiah War come to be. Well, comic book fans, that does it for Kami's Comic Corner this week. If you want more Kami's Comic Corner goodness, go to www.kamiscomiccorner.com. From there, you can subscribe to us on the RSS feed or on iTunes. Also, if you like any of the kick-ass t-shirts that I'm wearing, head on over to www.deadlinegraphics.net. The deal for March right now is free shipping in the U.S., so you can buy any shirt. It's going to get free shipping regardless. And also, our sponsor, Kelly, has a nice little Kami's Comic Corner fan appreciation contest. Now get this, people. All you have to do is go to www.deadlinegraphics.net, send Kelly an email with, your, with your, uh, the t-shirt that you want, uh, men or women's size, your uh, shipping address, and your name, and a winner will be randomly picked every week in April. And so if you do it right now, I will be announcing next week the first winner. So it's a great contest. It's a way of him giving back to the fans, both saying thank you for watching and thank you for participating. And you get a free t-shirt. How cool is that if you are the randomly picked winner? So head on over to www.deadlinegraphics.net and send Kelly an email today. So that does it for Game's Comic Corner this week. I hope to see you all next week. And please, why don't you go enter that contest? It's going to be great. 
Shazam. Goddamn.